Please join me in welcoming to the stage this year's co-chairs Natalia Sayas and Sarah Sock. Sarah. 
This conference is supported by the Office of the President of Teachers College, Columbia University. Because President Susan Furman is currently traveling, she has prepared a short video message. Welcome to Teachers College, Columbia University, and to the 35th Second Language Research Forum. I'm Susan Furman, President of Teachers College. We're proud that TC is hosting this prestigious forum for a second time. In 2005, we welcomed about 250 participants from 11 countries. This year, we have on our campus 700 attendees from 28 countries, with Japan, Canada, Spain, England, and South Korea topping the list. This extraordinary increase is a testament to the growing importance of second and foreign language learning in today's global society. It is also a reminder that the teaching and learning of languages is a complex endeavor worthy of cutting edge scholarship. Here at TC, scholarship always informs practice and learning and instruction are always deeply intertwined. This virtuous loop connecting learning, teaching, and real-world impact is illustrated in this year's theme, 30 Years of Instructed SLA, Learning, Instruction, Learning, and Outcome. TC's founder, Grace Dodge, was said to have the 100-year view in supporting the creation of institutions to meet the most difficult problems for generations to follow, and the college has never stopped acting on this long view. James Earl Russell acted on it here in 1899 when he taught the world's first course in comparative international education, and later as dean when he created an international institute that drew thousands of students to Teachers College. TC has welcomed students from across the globe ever since. A record 24% of this year's entering class is from outside the US. TC also launched one of the first programs in the teaching of Chinese to speakers of other languages. Today, our Center for International Foreign Language Teacher Education, led by Professor of Language and Education Xiao Hong Han, offers several programs, including a TICSOL, TESOL dual certificate program in Beijing. We're grateful to the Center and to our program in Applied Linguistics and TESOL for hosting this weekend's forum. Together, they are addressing critical demands, not only for qualified second and foreign language teachers, but also for improved understanding of the physical, psychological, and social dynamics of language acquisition. At a time when our nation has not always recognized the importance of encouraging bilingualism and multilingualism, we have been leaders. The Second Language Forum is particularly special because it is organized entirely by graduate students under the expert advisement of Professor Hahn. Thank you to TC Applied Linguistics doctoral students, Shafanaz Ahmed, Ji Young John, Adrian Liu, Mi Sun Park, Jaime Sun, and especially our wonderful co-chairs, Natalia Says and Sarah Sock, for their hard work and more than a year of planning. In addition to managing the heavy logistics of a large conference, they were charged with creating a program of great depth and breadth as you'll see, they did an excellent job. We're grateful to our workshop and roundtable leaders and to our plenary speakers, Rod Ellis, Roy Lister, Heidi Burns, and Michael Long for their participation and their extraordinary contributions to the field. A particular thank you to Dr. Ellis for traveling all the way from New Zealand. Thank you as well to the many volunteers from across TC for their time and dedication. Please don't hesitate to ask them any questions you have about the forum or about TC itself. Above all, enjoy yourself. This forum is a wonderful opportunity to form academic and professional connections, to share and discover new ideas and groundbreaking research, and to make friends. If you're visiting and have the time, we encourage you also to explore TC, Columbia, and New York City. We wish you a productive and fun weekend, and hope you come back again soon to Teachers College. And now we will get on to our first plenary. Let's welcome back Natalia Sayers to introduce Professor Liao. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to introduce to you Professor Ronald Liao, 
who will be the moderator of our first post-plenary roundtable. Um, Dr. Liao is Professor of Applied Linguistics and Director of Spanish Language Instruction in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at Georgetown University. Professor Liao has published extensively in prestigious journals and has co-edited several books, including his most recent ones titled A Psycholinguistic Approach to Technology and Language Learning and Explicit Learning in the L2 Classroom, a Student-Centered Approach. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ronald Liao. for inviting me to present the first of the four very distinguished keynote speakers. I know them more personally, and it's my honor. And as you notice, if you're paying attention, I have nothing in my hands. I have 10 pages describing all the accomplishments, accolades that Professor Ennis has received during his last, the last four, three and a half decades in which he was in ISLA. I don't think it does justice to what he has contributed to the field of ISLA. So I want you to bear with me, indulge you a little bit, taking a Caribbean cruise. <laughs> yeah, I know. You don't have to pay. <laughs> Joshua pays me very well. <laughs> and if you believe that, I have a piece of an unbuilt wall to sell you. <laughs> but I want to take to the Caribbean where my island, La Isla, Spanish for island, and situate the, uh, Professor Ellis within the theme of this conference, which is ISA. So let's go on the cruise. And he said, it's all inclusive, it's free. Use your, use your imagination. <laughs> as we go along the choppy waters of SLA, as you can imagine, SLA surrounds the Isla. I can tell you a little horror story. There are some residents on my island who jumped into the cold and murky waters of SLA, never to be seen again. <laughs> but those who did return back to the island, you couldn't understand what you're talking about. Gibberish, some foreign language, had nothing to do with the people my people on the island. <clears throat> As a dear friend of mine described it, he said he, came, he found some huge fish, but the fish was not palatable to the residents of the island. So, Reso 2016, personal communication. What I'd like to do is, as we approach the island, to look at it as a huge, and to be politi politically correct, a huge instructed environment, since we can either be face-to-face -face or hybrid or online. And this island, divided into many compartments, logically because there are so many languages, different perceptions of language teaching and learning. We have, for example, a small amount of applied linguists, but they can't address all of the issues on the island. And we have, logically, a lot of issues on the island, unfortunately. We see a guy in the, as we approach the isla, there's this guy in Bermuda shorts, his feet are in the cold waters of the SLA water, SLA, but his feet are firmly stuck on the island. That's Professor Ellis. Certified, yes, I know the Bermuda short version. I'm not sure if you can swim, but anyway. It's, it's just imagination. But this is the guy who, for thir 35 years or more, has been contributing to this strand of ISLA in such a way that only I can count on my, on my hands a handful of researchers in the field. I can see several of them in here by the way. You know who you are. <laughs> but I can, let me talk about the issues. We have different perceptions of how language learning takes place. We have different approaches, methods, techniques, to recast and not to recast. The construct of learning. We use the word learn in SLA, ISLA, come to psychology, come to science, neuroscience, and you tell me how you define learning, that's good for you. We have issues of the role of attention, awareness, that processing, textual enhancement, does it work? Do students learn after being exposed to that type of thing? We had a, a, a town hall uh, meeting recently. There were shouts of, build the casinos, build the casinos. Because the party, some instructors want to bring in gaming into the curriculum. We have some people asking a simple question in the island. Should we send our kids overseas to have a better life? But Professor Ellis, and we don't call him Professor Ellis on the island, by the way, is either Uncle, Uncle Rod or Mr. Rod. <laughs> I'll go with the Uncle Rod. He gets a big picture of a grandfather. 
<laughs> I'm not talking about his age, by the way, sorry. <laughs> okay. But what he has done in Ireland, I tell you, he has, he has this huge, comprehensive, and remarkable overview of many of the issues that face us on the island. He has published books, several books, numerous, countless articles addressing many of these issues. He serves on boards, very important boards, committees that address the policies of the island. And I think he controls some of the news outlets, but I'm not sure. <laughs> His contribution permeates the entire island of ISLA, my island, not yours, mine. <laughs> He is someone that we look up to, that we invite him to baptisms and weddings and funerals. And of course, at the weddings, he'll give you a long treatise to the newlyweds, how to be productive. Scholarly, of course, not nothing else. So what I'm going to do is to show you how so important Uncle God is to us. He's so internationally known that he, right now he's associated with three universities. And he just became, if you don't know this, by the way, I'm going to charge you. He is, let's try to remember this, fellow in the Royal Society of New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Now, whatever that means, I don't know, but he told me. I don't know. <laughs> so I guess, but again, you know, we, have, we share the same grade here. Anyway. Yeah. What he's going to do in this plenary is to do what he does best. He's going to provide a comprehensive and I love this critical overview of our dear Mike Lawrence's focus on form. Mike is somewhere in here. I'm going to look forward to the moderating part, by the way. Because he's going to show us how he sees the big picture. And then he zooms into the problems and he provides suggestions. And so, without further ado, and please remove the imagery of the boomer shorts, I present to you Dr. Rod Ellis. respond to such an introduction as that. <laughs> I think the only way to respond is to say thank you very much. That was a very special introduction and I really appreciated it. Um, the, the president mentioned that I had come all the way from New Zealand, but as you can see, that is not quite accurate. <laughs> I've actually come all the way from Perth in Australia. And for you who do not know your geography, let me tell you, that is even further than New Zealand. I've chosen to talk about focus on form. Um, and I do so with some trepidation, because there is someone sitting in the audience here um, who is responsible it's disappeared from my screen here. There's no signal. What has happened to my screen here? Ah, it's back. I was saying I, I do with some trepidation because there is someone sitting in the audience who introduced this term and knows much more about it than me. Um, but I have chosen to talk about it because one of the things that I have come to realize as I have been writing for nearly 30 odd years about second language acquisition, more than 30 years, is that the names of constructs stay with us, but their reference, what they refer to, changes. And as a teacher of SLA, I have come to realize that this causes a lot of problems to students because very often they may lock into a fairly early definition of a particular term and not recognize that in fact it is changed. I think this is a characteristic of applied linguistics in general. I think applied linguistics has, is full of terms, full of constructs. The terms stay, the constructs evolve. 
and this creates a lot of problems in trying to actually make sense of a lot of research. So this is one of the reasons why I have, why I have chosen to talk about focus on form, because I think this in particular is a construct that has evolved over the years. In order to try to make sense of the term focus on form, I think we need to make a very clear distinction between approaches to language teaching as opposed to procedures. And you can see here on this slide that I have used the term FONF and FONFS to refer to the idea that there are two distinct approaches to teaching. And then I'm going to use the full form, focus on form and focus on forms, to refer not to complete procedures, not to complete approaches, but to uh, procedures that are involved in ISLA. So this is where I'm going to go in my talk. I'm going to try to give a very brief history of how this construct, focus on form, has evolved. And then I'm going to try to end up with my own definition, where I think it is now. I'm going to talk about different types of focus on form, a little bit about the psycholinguistic and discoursal dimensions of focus on form. Of course, one must also look at some criticisms leveled against focus on form. A very little bit about comparative studies that have investigated the two approaches and a few concluding statements. So first of all, a brief history of focus on form. I think you recognize the picture. Uh, the, the, the terms FONF and FONFS were initially introduced by Michael Long, and as far as I can see in his initial definitions of these terms, he defined them in terms of approaches, rather than in terms of procedures, although of course there were procedures linked to the two approaches. This is the first reference that I can really find to it. Maybe there's an earlier reference that I have not come across, but this is an article he wrote in 1988, 28 years ago. He says, a focus on form is probably a key feature of second language instruction. You do not, I do not think, on the other hand, that there's any evidence that an instructional program built around a series or even a sequence of isolated forms is any more supportable now, either theoretically, empirically, or logical, than it was when Krashen and others attacked it several years ago. Okay. So here is where he is introducing the idea of two basic approaches. Then there is his often quoted uh, extract from his 1991 article. Uh, again, he's defining it, I think, as approach, focus on form, overtly draws students' attention to linguistic elements as they arise incidentally in lessons, whose overriding focus is on meaning or communication. And in the same article, he contrasted it with the focus on forms approach, etc., which involved traditional language teaching based on a structural syllabus. In 1997, he published an article in which he now made a distinction between focus on form and focus on meaning, the latter being an approach where learners' focus was more or less entirely on meaning. So we end up, really, with three basic approaches. And what I try to do on this slide here is uh, I'm really summarizing uh, a publication of Michael, uh, how he summarized focus on forms, focus on meaning, and focus on form. If we try to summarize Long's early account of focus on form. This is what I think he conceptualized it as. First of all, he saw it as arising in interaction. In other words, focus on form was very much uh, an interactional feature, partly because it derived from his uh, PhD work on the negotiation of meaning and the various interactional strategies associated 
with uh, the negotiation of meaning. So it was very much conceived of as an interactional feature. It was also conceived of as a reactive feature. It was a reaction to something that someone said. Someone, someone says something, it creates a problem, and there is a reaction to that. And the reaction involves a focus on form. It's incidental, it's not pre-planned. It occurs incidentally. It's brief. And I think also in his early work, it's typically implicit. Again, because it was associated very much with the idea of negotiation of meaning. And it induces noticing. It causes learners to pay attention to particular forms that are problematic to them or that they need in order to communicate a message. And it induces form function mapping. It helps people to map a particular form onto a particular meaning that is conveyed by that form. And it constitutes an approach to teaching. So that seemed to me very much the early focus on form uh, as uh, presented by Michael Long. So we jump ahead to 2015. Uh, Michael produced uh, a book on task-based language teaching, which focus on form is, co of course, very closely connected to. And this is a quotation from that book. Focus on form involves reactive use of a wide variety of pedagogic procedures. I underline pedagogic procedures because it's now being talked much more in terms of procedures rather than in terms of approach. To draw learners' attention to linguistic problems in context as they arise during communication in TBLT. Typically, a student's work on problem-solving tasks, thereby increasing the likelihood that attention to code features will be synchronized with the learner's internal syllabus, developmental stage, and processing ability. So I think we can contrast where Michael seems to be now with where he was in some of his earlier work on focus on form. Uh, the theoretical foundation is still attention to form while communicating, and that has been a common thread. Approach or procedures, I think in the earlier it was conceived very much as both. Focus on form contrasted with focus on forms as approaches. In late, there seems to be less emphasis on that and more on focus on form as a procedures, but still both. Reactive and brief, yes, in both. Interactive, early on, very clearly so. Later, not so clearly so, because he recognizes that there are some focus on form strategies that are not actually interactive now. So it's not a purely interactive phenomenon. Incidental or intentional learning, early, very much incidental. That figured in the quotations that I've already given to you. Late, both incidental and intentional, because now he recognizes, in fact, that focus on form can involve much more intentional focus on form. Implicit and explicit, early, I think the emphasis was very much on implicit, the later, version of focus on form is that it can involve both implicit and much more explicit procedures, such as metalinguistic information. Okay, that's Michael. <laughs> and you'll have a chance to tell me how wrong I have been in presenting him. Defining focus on form. Let's move quickly to Doughty and Williams, who produced a book in 1998 with the focus on form in the title, and they pointed out that focus on form and focus on form's approaches were not polar opposites. They said that focus on form entails a focus on formal elements of language, whereas focus on forms is limited to such an approach. But this seems to raise a bit of a question, and the question that it raises is if we turn to PPP, presentation, practice, produce, which is still perhaps the most common methodology for teaching languages that we find in most textbooks. Is PPP a focus on form approach or is it a focus on forms approach? We could argue that it is a focus on forms approach because it's based on a structural syllabus. PPP is based on a structural syllabus and it involves giving implicit instruction, etc. 
But you could also say that it involves including a focus on form as a procedure in the final P. So the final P is where students do a communicative activity, and during that communicative activity, there can be focus on form procedures, etc. Right. This is why, to my mind, it is quite crucial to distinguish between the use of this term as an approach and the use of this term as a procedure. And interestingly, in Doughty and Williams' book, there is an article by Robert de Keyser where basically he talks about skill learning theory. And in that particular book, which occurs in a book with focus on form as the title, he's really talking about PPP. Okay. So in other words, you can have focus on form in PPP. So there would seem to be an incompatibility of definitions. But perhaps such a view is clearly incompatible with Long's earlier and later accounts of focus on form. The idea that PPP can include focus on form would seem to be incompatible with both where Long was early on and where he is now. Because Long makes a fundamental distinction between a synthetic approach involving the linear teaching of discrete linguistic features, focus on forms, and an analytical approach where attention to form only emerges out of the efforts to comprehend and produce meaningful texts in the second language. Okay. So there would seem to be some kind of incompatibility here. So how do we resolve this definitional problem? And again, it seems to me that to resolve it, we need to make a very clear distinction about whether we are using these terms to refer to, refer to approaches, or whether we are using these terms to refer to different types of procedures. And this is what I'm trying to do here. A focus on form is best understood not as an approach, not as FONF, but as involving different kinds of instructional procedures that attract attention to form during communication. And of course, if you define it like that, yes, it can occur in PPP. In the final stage of PPP, you can have focus on form occur. Focus on forms entails various devices, such as exercises, explicit metalinguistic explanation, etc., which direct learners' attention to specific forms. And they can be studied and learned as objects. Right? So I want to go on a little bit now and ask a series of other questions as to whether these will include focus on form or focus on forms. First of all, I think we have to ask is focus on form planned or is it unplanned? Remember, in the early definition, it was very much presented as something that happens incidentally. But can it, in fact, be planned? In Long's account, it was unplanned and unfocused. But if we accept that focus on form can occur in PPP, in the final P, right, then clearly it is planned and clearly also it's focused. However, if we accept that focus on form constitutes a set of procedures rather than approach, we also need to accept that it can be planned as well as unplanned. And so I would argue that focus on form is not an incidental phenomenon. It can be planned. Negotiation of meaning or negotiation of form. This distinction comes from Roy Lister's work, who will be talking to us later on in this uh, conference. Long initially viewed focus on form as arising when communication problems occurred, but subsequently he seems to accept that it can also occur when there is no communication problem. Negotiation in the classroom does not only occur when there's some kind of communication breakdown. Negotiation of form occurs when a teacher or sometimes another learner chooses to draw attention to form even though there's no actual problem in meaning. So I would argue, in fact, I would argue that it can be both. It can involve negotiation of meaning or it can involve negotiation of form. Reactive or preemptive? Long also insists that focus on form as occurs as a response to a problem. This is consistent from the early version to the late version, right? It's reactive, according to Long. But can it also be preemptive? 
as for example when a learner asks a question about a linguistic form during a communicative activity. And students do this. Research that I have done, descriptive research, looking at task-based lessons, shows quite clearly that students do preempt attention to form by asking a particular question about form, etc. It's not uncommon, particularly with adult motivated learners, etc. Preemptive focus on form really aims to avoid rather than to repair a, uh, repair a problem. And the quotation here is from the research that we carried out. Preemptive focus on form is in fact quite common. So is it correct to say that focus on form is just reactive? Or can focus on form also be preemptive when teachers perhaps answer students' questions about particular forms? Interactive focus on form. Interactive focus on form can be defined as the preemptive or responsive procedures that attract attention to form during an activity that is primarily meaning focus. Right? So interactive focus on form is not just reactive, it can be preemptive as well. Interactive or non-interactive, whereas focus on form was seen as an interactive phenomenon, it can also clearly it, is, it can also clearly be non-interactive. And the most obvious example of this is text enhancement procedures. And Michael Long in his 250, 2015 book does actually talk about text enhancement procedures. Text enhancement procedures are an example of focus on form. They are not interactive. Students are given a written text. Certain forms are highlight, highlighted with a view of attracting their attention to those forms. Obtrusive or non-obtrusive. Uh, non focus on form was initially seen as involving unobtrusive procedures because it was associated very much with negotiation of meaning. So more implicit type strategies to draw learners' attention to form. But it's now clearly seen as also including obtrusive procedures. And I think Michael in his 2015 book <coughs> accepts that focus on form can sometimes even involve quick metalinguistic explanation, as long as it's reactive. But should the more obtrusive procedures that direct rather than attract attention to form, such as those involved in Van Patten's processing <coughs> instruction, should they be viewed as focus on forms rather than focus on form, right? And I think here we do have a murky area, exactly when does focus on forms switch into focus on forms. Within or outside communication, focus on form was clearly conceived as occurring while learners were attempting to communicate. That was central to the original definition. But if we look at Peter Skeen's work, and we look at all the work that he's done on pre-task planning, and one of the purposes of pre-task planning is to get students to focus on form in the context of trying to work out what they want to say, right? So this is not now occurring within communication. This is occurring prior to communication. And the term focus on form has been used by Skian to refer to this, uh, to, to the idea that you can focus learners' attention on form before they actually start to communicate. So finally, here I am. This is where I think we now are, and I think we do need an encompassing definition of focus on form. Yes, meaning is primary. That's what stayed the same all the way along. It's a set of procedures. We should perhaps stop thinking about it as an approach and think of it as a set of procedures deployed by the teacher and all learners to draw attention implicitly or explicitly, often briefly, but not always that brief, to problematic linguistic forms. It can be pre-planned or can arise incidentally in response to communicative or linguistic problems, not just communicative, linguistic as well. It can be interactive or non-interactive and involve both production and reception. It can be found in both explicit and implicit approaches to language teaching, and it can also occur before a communicative task is performed or while it is being performed. 
but meaning is primary, so it's still got this very close link to the idea of performing a communicative task. Well, this then allows me to develop a classification of focus on form procedures, and I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but I just want to try to show it to you. As a result of my definition, I think that we can think about focus on form being within the task or outside the task. If it's within the task, it can be interactive or non-interactive. If it's interactive, it can be preemptive or reactive. It can involve negotiation, meaning negotiation of form. Outside the task, it can be done through pre-task, a pre-task activity, such as pre-task planning, perhaps also post-task, by getting students to repeat a particular task, which again leads to a focus on form. So we can end up with a classification of types of focus on form such as that. Now I want to talk a little bit about the psycholinguistic dimensions of focus on form and then also a little bit about the discoursal features of it. Obviously, a key psycholinguistic feature is selective at attention. In focus on form activities, attention is selectively focused on meaning, but may also from time to time be voluntarily or involuntarily focused on specific linguistic forms that occur in the input that the learner needs to express a particular meaning. Selective attention, the idea that you can be primarily focused on meaning, but your attention can switch selectively to form. Consciousness is another key psycholinguistic feature. Focus on form caters to incidental, implicit acquisition. It may or may not involve consciousness. Actually, I sometimes thought I could also write a paper looking at the difference in the meanings of incidental and implicit. Do we all know the differences between incidental acquisition and implicit acquisition? To my mind, incidental acquisition is neutral as to whether consciousness is involved. But when you talk about implicit acquisition, implicit learning, you're assuming that there is no consciousness involved. Okay. Whether noticing a form is needed may depend on the salience of the linguistic feature. And so this leads to what I think is a very interesting question. Are different kinds of focus on form needed to facilitate the acquisition of different linguistic features? Right? Maybe some features you do not need very explicit focus on form. With other features, maybe you need much more explicit focus on form. Focus on form involves a cognitive comparison can help learners to compare the current state of their second language knowledge with the input that they're provided with. with. And Doughty and Williams coined this very useful term, cognitive window, the idea that there's a small time where the learner is able to make some kind of comparison between the forms that they have used and the forms that are in the input made available to them through focus on form. Timing of focus on form. This also strikes me as a very crucial issue and one which there's very little research. And there are, of course, three possibilities. We could encourage learners to focus on form prior to them starting to communicate, or we can do it while communicating, which is the primary idea of focus on form, or perhaps later after a communicative activity is, is, o is over. In other words, one might delay the focus on form until the communicative activity is over and then go over various problems in form that emerged when the students were doing a communicative task. But is this focus on form? And I think that that is a very interesting question. Relative effectiveness. If what is important is that learners' attention to form takes place while they are primarily engaged in meaning making, either receptively or productively, and focus on form prior or during communication can have merit. But to date, we do not know really whether the delayed focus on form is effective. In fact, recently I published a study with Xiaofeng Li um, where we did try to look at the relative effects of providing focus on form during a communicative activity, as opposed to delaying it until the communicative activity is over. 
to see whether there was any substantial difference. We were unable to find any substantial difference. I think it still remains an open question. I think from the point of view of the theory of focus on form, ideally it's got to occur in the cognitive window, rather than be delayed until after the activity is over. But I think it's an open and empirical question as to whether delayed focus on form, if we want to call it focus on form, is in fact just as effective as focus on form that occurs during the activity. Working memory, we're going to hear lots of talks on working memory here. It's limited in capacity, though not all, not all theories of working memory do assume a limited capacity. As a site where information can be temporarily stored, rehearsed to prolong activation, processed by establishing links with long-term procedural and declarative memory. And working memory takes us back to that old term intake, because that's where intake occurs in working memory. But there are some issues here. Does focus on form need to be general, as with Skian, or specific, as with Long? Skian dismisses the idea of focus on form involving specific attention to specific features of language, and argues instead that there's a more sort of general orientation to focus on form. Does focus on form facilitate the development of procedural memory? implicit knowledge, or declarative memory, explicit knowledge. And there's a little study by Revesh, which went some way to trying to address this. She investigated the relationship between gains in grammatical accuracy following recasting. Differences in the learner's phonological working memories were related to accuracy in an oral description task, and differences in their complex working memory we're related to gains in a written test. So we have two aspects of working memory, right? Phonological working memory and complex working memory where some kind of analysis takes place as well. And how the learners process the recasts in working memory affected where the development led to procedural or declarative knowledge, right? So here we can see that what's going on in working memory may well influence what learners get from focus on form. Discursal dimension of focus on form. Again, I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but just to emphasize that there are different types of focus on form. I've already mentioned that, to my mind, focus on form can be preemptive as well as reactive, and if it's preemptive, it can be student-initiated or it can be teacher-initiated. Students can ask questions about forms while communicating. Teachers can also sometimes ask questions or give advice to students to try to avoid a particular pro a linguistic problem. Reactive can be conversational, as with recasts, implicit recasts, or can be more didactic when uh, teachers elect to focus on a linguistic form even though there is no communication breakdown and do so quite explicitly. A little bit about research findings. I'm going to go through some of the main research findings about focus on form. Teachers are often not aware of the extent to which they engage in focus on form. This became quite clear in the research that we did. We would record lessons where teachers were engaged in task-based language teaching, and at the end we would interview them, and we found out that they didn't think that they were doing focus on form, and then we would show them all the times that they actually did focus on form. This isn't surprising, because when you go into a classroom, you go in to teach a language, you go in to learn it, and it's very unlikely that there are not going to be numerous occasions when you do focus on form. I attended a lecture once in London when uh, Michael Swan was also talking, and I was talking about focus on form, and at the end of my talk he stood up and said, this is a load of nonsense, teachers don't do it. Right? But that's an empirical question I said to him. You know, I said, if you actually go and look, you'll find out that they do do it, and they do it all the time. Both teachers and learners vary in the extent to which they engage in focus on form. Sean Lowen uh, was able to show that there's enormous variety in the extent to which teachers engage in it. 
Both learners and teachers sometimes make effective use of the learner's L1 to address L2 problems. No reason why the L1 cannot play a role in focus on form. Mainly focus on form episodes address lexical or grammatical problems. And even grammatical, they don't tend to address morphological things. They tend to address more syntactical things. But pragmatic aspects of language from our descriptive studies tend to get neglected. The instructional context affects the frequency with which different focus on form occurs. There was a study done by Sheen who compared looking at recasts in different uh, instructional contexts and was able to show that um, the extent to which uh, recasting occurs varies substantially from one context to another as does uptake, where the students respond. Various factors influence whether learners notice those forms that are focused on, in particular the level of explicitness. By and large, learners seem to notice more, pay more attention if the focus on form is explicit rather than implicit. <coughs> uptake with repair cannot, of course, be taken as evidence of learning. The fact that learners respond to, say, a recast by self-correcting cannot be taken as evidence of learning, but some studies have shown that there seems to be a relationship between uptake with repair and actual learning that takes place. Both focus on form initiated by learners in learner-learning interaction and by teachers in whole class interaction benefit acquisition. In other words, whether the focus on form occurs in group work or whether it occurs in a whole class environment, it has been shown to be effective. In interactions involving the teacher, preemptive focus on form is more effective than reactive focus on form if the learner preempts. Right? If the learner preempts, not the teacher, then this seems to be more effective. A stronger effect is evident when the teacher participates in small group work than in whole class interaction. If the teacher is teaching the whole class as opposed to moving around and sitting with groups, there's some evidence to suggest that focus on form from the teacher is more effective in a small group context than in a whole class context. And higher proficiency learners focus on form more and benefit more from it than lower proficiency learners. So these are some of the findings that come out of the now very rich range of research on focus on form. A little bit of investigating the effects of focus on form. Here I simply want to point out the four types of research that really relate to the investigation of focus on form. One is text enhancement, which I've already mentioned, the idea that learners can be given texts, say written texts with certain forms highlighted to draw attention to them. By and large, the research does not show that text enhancement is that effective. Um, Professor Han conducted a narrative review in which he questioned the value of, of text enhancement. Corrective feedback, lots and lots of evidence to suggest that focus on form as corrective feedback is very effective. Pre-task planning, lots of research to suggest that pre-task planning can have an effect particularly on complexity but also on accuracy. Task repetition, less clear evidence that task repetition, simply getting students to repeat a task, does actually transfer to improved accuracy, improved complexity on a new task, right? So really, the two types of focus on form investigations that have been most profitable in terms of demonstrating an effect on learning or on performance are corrective feedback and pre-task planning. Critiques of focus on form, again, I'm going to go through these very quickly. Focus on form is based entirely on theoretical hypotheses that are themselves lacking in empirical support, right? I'm not going to address each of these, I'm just going to mention them. Focus on form consists only of quick feedback on learners' errors while they're performing a communicative task. Advocates a focus on form presented as the only theoretically sound way of teaching an L2, 
rejecting focus on forms entirely. <coughs> There's no report of any successful long-term implement implementation of focus on form. No evidence to show that focus on form results in superior L2 learning. Focus on form is ill-suited to non-Western cultures of teaching and learning. These are the kinds of criticisms that have been leveled at task-based language teaching, and in particular, <coughs> focus on form, which is so central to task-based language teaching. I'm not going to go over those, but if you're interested in the responses to those criticisms, there are two articles, one by me, right, sorting out the misunderstandings, and one much more recent by Michael in defense of tasks and TBLT. Okay. In general, these criticisms demonstrate a misunderstanding of focus on form and an ignorance of the research that's investigated. But probably one area that I do differ from Michael is the whole issue of cultural inappropriateness or appropriateness, right? Because I tend to think that there are, I spend a lot of my time moving around countries like China, Korea, Japan, etc., a little bit closer to New Zealand and Australia. <laughs> Right? I don't suffer from jet lag so much. <laughs> and I have begun to realize that trying to introduce pure task-based language teaching, that's a term that Michael uses, pure task-based language teaching, is going to be very problematic for a whole variety of reasons in those particular contexts. And that maybe one needs some kind of compromise. Comparative studies. Um, there are two types of comparative studies that one can do. One's back here to the idea of focus on form and focus on forms as approaches. And one wants to ask whether in fact one approach is overall more effective than another approach. So there are global studies and there are local studies. By and large, I don't know of any global studies that have compared... Global, stu global method studies don't usually work. In any case, they've been abandoned. But local studies which focus on the acquisition of specific linguistic features have been carried out. There's one by Sheen, Ron Sheen, in 2006. And there's one by one of my PhD students, Natsuko Shintani, uh, who compared um, task-based language teaching with focus on form versus PPP, right? With some focus on form in the PPP as well. Uh, Arguably, we do need, we do need to know whether in fact these two approaches, we can say that one is more effective than another. And perhaps what we need more than anything is longitudinal studies. And there are very few longitudinal studies of task-based language teaching, which includes the focus on form, that I know of. And you'll be relieved to know, I just about reached my conclusion. <laughs> Is focus on form appropriate for instructional context where education is conceived more as a process of knowledge and communication than as a process of using knowledge for immediate purposes? This is a quote from Bill Littlewood. I ask it as a question. Um, I think in terms of pure task-based language teaching, I would probably agree with Littlewood that there's little chance of it being successfully implemented in many teaching contexts. Teachers are not familiar with focus on form. Learners view language as an object. These are this particular situation that you get in Japan or China or Korea, etc. If you have these conditions, is the idea of task-based language teaching along with focus on form, is it going to be practical? And finally, I want to emphasize that if we're going to make any sense of focus on form, I think we should perhaps use the term to refer to procedures rather than a complete approach. Focus on form procedures belong naturally to task-based teaching, but they can also be found in more traditional approaches like PPP, providing there is some opportunity for free production in the L2. I think we urgently need studies that compare focus on form treatments that include and exclude explicit instruction. In other words, we need studies that look at what is called um, um, task-based language teaching as opposed to task-supported language teaching. 
Focus on form occurs in both task-supported language teaching as essentially PPP, right? It differs from task-based language teaching because there is a prior stage where there is explicit presentation of language before students do a communicative task, right? Task-supported language teaching. But focus on form procedures occur within task-supported language teaching. So what I think we really need to know is, is there a substantial difference between task-supported language teaching with the focus on form restricted to the final stage where students do a communicative task, or is, is pure task-based language teaching where there's no explicit presentation and the focus on form occurs during the meaningful communication? We need, we need studies that compare that. And in fact, that is, some, that is where some of my own research is currently going. But uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to tell you about that today. And if you are interested in trying to read up on what I've been talking about in my talk, uh, there is an article which actually covers more or less what I've been talking about here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ellis, Uncle Ellis, that was wonderful. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this marks the end of the morning plenary. We will take a 10 minute break. For those of you interested in discussing the topic of the talk with Dr. Ellis, the post plenary and Dr. Liao, the post plenary roundtable moderated by Dr. Liao will take place here in Cowan after the break, and that is in about 10 minutes. At this time, the co chairs will share a few announcements. Hi everyone, as Shafin has mentioned, the roundtable takes place in Cowan, not Millbank, uh, for this first session. So if you want to participate in the roundtable, please return here. Also, for those of you going straight to lunch, um, there is information about restaurants on our website and also in the resources section of your program book. Uh, there are many restaurants nearby in walking distance. You could also Yelp it by searching the Morningside neighborhood. Also, at 7 p.m. tonight, we'll have a small reception in the Grace Dodge uh, Dining Hall, which is on the ground floor of the Grace Dodge building and also a courtyard that is attached to it. Um, finally, if you feel yourself this you feel lost, please feel free to ask anyone wearing a blue or light blue t-shirt. Um, they're all volunteers for SLURP and we'd be more than happy to point you in the right direction. And one more announcement, if you use social media, um, feel free to use the hashtag SLURP2016 to see photos by fellow SLURP attendees. Thank you.